So at this point, it's my great pleasure to introduce our first keynote speaker for this event. Um, I'd like to, to welcome Professor Kevin Anderson, who's Professor of Energy and Climate Change at the University of Manchester. And he's going to take us on a journey from willful delusion to action on climate change, a fair response to Paris. So over to you, Kevin. Thank you very much. I'll just uh, share. Hope this works well here. What was that worrying moment as you swat switch over? Hopefully you can you can see that now, can you? I'm getting no response, so I'm assuming that you can. That's looking good, Kevin. Is it okay? Excellent, right? So, um, as was noted, then uh, is, I've called this presentation from willful delusion to action on climate change: a fair response um, to Paris. Um, and I'm going to start off with a little bit of science and. This is not meant to sound be flippant, but um, really just to remind us that the climate does not respond to good intentions, to Machiavellian policies, to eloquent arguments, legal niceties or accountancy scams of one sort or another. All of this is actually trumped by the brutal beauty of the physics. And that makes absolutely clear that it's the total quantity of carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases that we dump in the atmosphere that relate to temperature. And I think we have to remind ourselves sometimes of the simple science behind this um, and that our responses need to be in line with that science. I also think we need to start off with a little bit of humility, particularly people of my of my generation. Um, so if we go back to 1990 in the first report from the IPCC or indeed 92 in the Rio summit, we look now 31 years later and emissions are over 60 percent higher than they were in 1990 and they were certainly going up in 2019 still and they're likely to go up maybe not this year probably similar to 2019 but maybe next year so despite all of the rhetoric optimistic rhetoric we've we've heard over the last 30 odd years we provided over really abject failure in terms of reducing our total emissions at least collectively and i think it's worth to stop and reflect and we obviously have to change direction but what we often hear from different parts of the world but here in the uk we often hear the language that isn't the uk showing leadership we hear Sort of numbers such as oh well in 2018 uh, our emissions were 44 percent lower than they were in 1990 and more recently in 2020 they were 51 percent lower than they were in 1990 this sort of language is used for many countries but particularly the uk often demonstrating its climate change credentials but if you include international aviation and shipping and indeed our imports and our exports then i would argue there's been no real climate change leadership over the last 30 years not that's driven significant emissions in line with our commitments We've seen at most probably about 15% reduction since 1990. That's less than half a percent every single year, far, far falling short of what we would need to do to avoid dangerous climate change. But that same message is true of other so-called climate progressive countries, whether that's Denmark, Sweden, France, or indeed the EU more generally, you know, all countries that claim leadership, when you actually unpick the details, they're all still pretty much as carbon rich as they were in those days. Um, but the argument then is, isn't the UK you know, showing wider leadership when we've, we've got this language now of climate emergency? So we see this in Scotland, we see it in Northern Ireland, and um, we see it in, in the Welsh government. And of course, the UK Parliament has now declared a climate emergency. But um, when we sort of play that out, what are we seeing as a response? Well, no sweeping and rapid social change that we did see with the banking crisis, that we did indeed see with, with COVID, we are still seeing with COVID. No immediate and widespread penetration of low carbon technologies. So we hear about lots more renewables, but they're plus oil and gas and indeed perhaps Cumbrian coal. So we're still about 80% fossil fuel development. 30 years on, we're 80% fossil fuel development. We're certainly selling more um, electric vehicles, but we're also selling lots of petrol and diesel vehicles and including uh, huge um, sports utility vehicles. In 2019, for every EV that was sold, there were 37 petrol or diesel this year um, in the sale of EVs about there were eight and a half percent of the market that means 90 percent of the market is still petrol and diesel cars that we're locking into the system for the next five to ten years and the latest what we're capturing this climate emergency is that under this language of net zero by 2045 or 2050 this has emerged the ubiquitous response to our emergency and what i want to do over the next sort of five minutes or so before putting some other slides together is actually trying to unpick what this means because is net zero an appropriate framework for addressing paris and our temperature equity commitments 
just bear in mind that whilst we've had this net zero frame ring, the government has enthusiastically embraced the BP Clary Phase 2 platform. That's a quarter of a billion tonnes of two over the lifetime of that, plant, that facility. The new Glen Gorn gas discovery, enthusiasm over that, and the 100 million tonnes of carbon dioxide. The um, um, new sort of gas site near Hull in East Yorkshire, another 13 million tonnes of carbon dioxide. The huge and liquefied natural gas facility in Mozambique, um, which is which the UK government has put in one billion pounds, or is putting putting in one billion pounds of UK taxpayers' money, um, along with other other um, oil companies. That's over four billion tons of CO2 in that facility. And of course, we heard yesterday about the government hoping to license the new uh, blocks over near near Shetland, which is an, about another seventy five million tons of carbon dioxide. I think really that the UK government's own oil and gas authority. Um, it's important, it gives an important sense of, of how serious we're taking this emergency. If we look at their website or indeed their, their Twitter account, look at their opening about us, and it gives a lie to the appropriateness of net zero. So this is, this is the government's own oil and gas authority says that we work, we work with the industry and government to maximize the economic recovery of oil and gas, maximize the economic recovery of oil and gas and support the UK government in its drive to reach net zero greenhouse gas emissions by 2050, an oxymoron if ever you saw one. So let's go back now to our commitments that we've made in Paris and, and just revisit those. So we committed to stay well below two degrees centigrade and one point, and ideally aimed just for 1.5. But I think we have to recognize these are incredibly dangerous thresholds for many people around the world, typically poor people um, who have had very little responsibility for the emissions in the atmosphere. That we're going to make our changes in accordance with the best science and on the basis of equity, which I would argue no nation has seriously uh, taken seriously, no wealthy nation, certainly. So what does the IPCC, the Governmental Panel on Climate Change, tell us about Paris? Well, in a very sort of heroic fashion, I'm summarising all of the mitigation analysis from the IPCC into one sentence or the science framing us on, on mitigation and say it's about carbon budgets. That's what matters. Not long term targets. It's the carbon budgets that relate to temperature, most closely relate to temperature. And that basically is the area under the curve you can see here. And if in the short term we decide to build 27, spend 27 billion pounds on new roads or extend our airport, airports or whatever that might be, then in theory at least future generations will have to compensate for that. But I will try and show here that will simply be impossible. Now, if you take the latest IPCC report and update the numbers to January 2022, making some estimate of what will happen over the next six months at a global level, um, and I'm focusing here on energy and carbon dioxide, then to meet our Paris 1.5 and 2 degrees C commitments, we can put into the atmosphere something like 600 billion tonnes of carbon dioxide. Now, it could be a bit higher than that. It could be a bit lower, but it gives us a good handle of, of the scale of the challenge that we face. In 2019, and then almost certainly for this year, we'll be seeing something like 36 to 36 and a half billion tonnes of carbon dioxide emit emitted. That's, so that's about 17 years of current emissions at a global level before we breach our, our two degree C commitment. Remember, that's the global level. So why is this framing so different to net zero? Well, first, let's be clear. Net zero is a new phrase. This is not something. If you look at the IPCC's latest report, then in the summary for policymakers, it's referred to 16 times. If you look at the last report in 2014, it's not mentioned once. If you look at the CCC's sixth budget, budget report out in 2020, it's mentioned between 3,000 and 5,000 times. Every page, pretty much, it's on there 10, 20, sometimes 30 times. If you look at the CCC's fifth budget report, I couldn't find one reference to net zero in that report. So it's a new phrase. It is true to say that scientists in the sort of more detailed discussions have been talking about net cumulative emissions and so forth for a long time, but the appealing translation from, from the more sort of science framing of net um, into this concept of net zero um, and, and be ubiquitous and I say very appealing to policymakers in particular, this is a new and very recent change. Um, it is not based on the concept of total carbon budget. So we, we move away, I would argue, quite a long way from the science from this. It tends to focus on a far off end point. Think about it, the scientists, the advisors and the policymakers will almost all be either retired or dead in 2045 to 2050. And yet that's the framing we're having here. And it's guided by what this sort of very nebulous term of highest possible ambition, not the quantitative requirement to meet 1.5 and 2 degrees centigrade and take, an account, take account of equity as is required in the Paris Agreement. It also is deeply reliant on uh, the future uptake of carbon of uh, um, application of carbon dioxide removal. This is through either negative emission technologies 
which are technologies which either are in very small pilot schemes or still in the imagination of a few academics, that we hope that our children and our children's children will be able to deploy at a huge planetary scale. And also this other, uh, I think, dangerous framing of nature-based solutions. So, so these are the things that, that we hope future generations, our children, our children's children will deploy. And these are locked into virtually all of the scenarios. Indeed, net zero is awash with these negative emissions. My position on this is that, yes, let's fund our, let's have a major R&D program into negative emissions and nature-based solutions and deploy them potentially if they meet very stringent sustainability criteria. But let's cut our emissions today from energy, assuming that, these, that it does not work at scale. And anyway, some form of carbon dioxide removal will be necessary to remove the residual greenhouse gas emissions from agriculture, principally methane and nitrous oxide, that cannot be eliminated, whatever we may do with agriculture. So actually, energy does need to be real zero CO2. A lot of the a lot of people also argue that net zero is quite helpful because it's a framework for us all to, to come together under. But in my seriously undermining the need for immediate and deep cuts in emissions today. The UK is a good example of that. Where if you look at the um, UK, uh, look at the spreadsheets from the Seat Committee on Climate Change underpinning this whole framing of net zero, it doesn't go to zero emissions, even from fossil fuel in 2050. It's still got 30 to 31 million tonnes of carbon dioxide from fossil fuel use in 2050. And that's higher emissions per person in 2050, even for population growth than a typical Kenyan has today. It also assumes that in the second half of the century, we will continue to burn fossil fuels. Probably somewhere in the region of 700 million tonnes of carbon dioxide of fossil fuel, will, a fossil fuel based CO2 will be emitted after 2050 from the UK. It, as I said before, it also relies heavily upon future generations removing carbon dioxide, removing our carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. Many hundreds of billions of tonnes of CO2 is anticipated to be removed in our scenarios. And I think it's important to note, at least in my, in my interpretation of net zero as I can see it, it's almost complete neglect of international and indeed national equity, despite the huge imbalance in historical and indeed current emissions. Put simply, net zero allows large but still incremental changes to business, usual, to business as usual, um, to be sort of disguised as being in line with our Paris temperature and equity commitments. And I would argue it falls far short of that. So how far short is it for? Well, the work that colleagues and I uh, did last year, looking in detail at the developed parts of the world, so-called developed parts of the world, and then also particularly UK and Sweden, says that our, our carbon budgets, if they were played out more globally, then we're more in line with two and a half to three degrees centigrade of warming than one and a half to two degrees centigrade. And I say that was the same for Sweden. And I think the UK and Sweden are probably ahead of many of the other European countries. So what alternative could we imagine to net zero? Well, I think we should be using a carbon budget framing, but for all of its drawbacks, I think it still provides a real guide to drive early policy change. And it's much more in line with the science than sort of highest possible ambition. So carbon budget framing around Paris. That we should go for real zero CO2 for the wealthy parts of the world, developed countries, by about 2035. That sounds ridiculously early, but we should have started early, uh, earlier than we have done now. We, we've squandered 30 years. And remember, that's planes, trains, ships, industry, houses, everything, 2035. We should have a separate target for CO2 from industrial processes, such as um, cement and steel. And there are some arguments behind that in relation to equity, which I won't go into now, but that's why I think that's important. That is separate from the energy CO2. Another separate target for agricultural emissions, from particularly non-CO2 emissions of methane and nitrous oxide. And arguably, they could be separate as well because they have very different atmospheric chemistries and a separate target for um, a million tonnes of carbon dioxide captured through either uh, negative emission technologies or nature-based solutions. And what really separates this out from a net zero framing, and I think this is absolutely fundamental, is there should be strictly no substitution between any of these. As soon as you get substitution between these, you get all sorts of Machiavellian policies coming in and accountancy ruses. You know, make it clear, make it something so, you, so people can be held to account and it, gives, it provides a clear market and political signal for these particular domains, much more reliable, I think, than the net zero framing. Treat it like the emergency it is. And if you play this out from a mitigation point of view, it means well over 10% reduction in emissions every single year, heading more, more to a 20% by 2030. As a total emission reduction compared with our emissions today or 2019 of about three quarters, about 75% by 2030.
Zero carbon energy by about 2035. Planes, trains, ships, everything. Real zero, not net zero. This is immediate and profound system change. And no doubt some of you will be shaking your head saying this isn't possible. Well, we should have started earlier. It's more possible to deal with this than live a good life with three or four degrees centigrade of warming. So let's give a flavor now of what those policies, to both in scope and scale, might look like if we were to actually really respond to the climate emergency. Now, I'm just going to touch on these, so I'm not going to go into any detail here. But this thing about power generation, well, currently in the UK, of our final energy con consumption, only about 20%, less than 20%, is actually electricity. So only about 300 terawatt hours there or thereabouts out of, say, 1,500 to 1,700 terawatt hours for the UK energy consumption. So we're going to need a massive electrification program. And I would suggest it needs to some, something like, if you take this, the Committee on Climate Change's um, zero CO2 generation, power generation, you need to multiply that by a factor of two to three times and do it much faster. Another thing that needs to go with that is absolutely no new fossil fuel stations from now. So there are lots of other issues there. I've touched on a few here, but um, I'm now going to just think about transport. And there are a whole load of things we can do on transport. Firstly, and the immediate thing is to reverse the 27 billion pounds on new roads and indeed reverse the London Mayor's Silver Tunnel uh, Silvertown tunnel development but also no new fossil fuel cars including no hybrids from 2025 so bring it much much earlier if this is an emergency you don't wait till 2030 to start to put the fire out and also I think this this means this leads us to the idea that we have a shift from car ownership to rental models in our towns and our cities so in the towns and cities we'd use much more active transport and public transport and only when we were traveling further across rural environments, would we then consider using cars that we would, that we would rent for the time that we needed? There's lots of um, environmental sustainability and climate change benefits of doing this. So this would mean we would not roll out charging points through our cities and towns, maybe on the outskirts in the rental centers, and a different sort of place-based approach to rural transport um, parts of the country. So strategies need to be much more place-based. Um, touching on aviation, absolutely no more airport expansion, no first or business class because they have much higher emissions per person and a rapidly escalating frequent flyer levy. And this would have to go up so fast that it should be stopping people flying if they're flying three or four or five times, that should be stopped. So we'll not curtail people who fly occasionally, but people who fly very regularly, they would have to be stopped by a frequent flyer levy. If we think about buildings, you know, why on earth are we not doing this already? But from January 2022, set a standard. So it should be passive house plus as a minimum for all new buildings. A major and deep and, and a major and high quality retrofit of your existing buildings that are going to be here in 2050 and beyond. And I think a maximum size for new properties is also important there, both from um, sort of an energy and sustainability point, uh, an energy point of view, but also from a sustainability and land use point of view. Much less material use, and much less land use, and already a, a highly populated island. No new green, no greenfield developments, and no second homes, and all of this within stringent controls on materials. And the final thing here, just about oil and gas, it's always the issue that no one really wants to touch. But we need to cease all new developments now. All new developments. And we need a planned and just phase out of all UK oil and gas production by about 2035, really more like 2030 at the latest, 2035. And the word just is important there. We don't want to destroy those communities like we did with the mining communities by not giving sufficient foresight to the people who actually work in those industries today. And actually, we need that expertise anyway for making the shift to zero carbon. And we need to take equity seriously. And again, this is just completely dismissed to just lip service at best at the international level, but even within our own countries. The changes I'm suggesting do not apply equally to all, far from it. There's a massive imbalance in responsibility from emission, for emissions. Globally, half of all emissions from the rise from the activities of just 10% of the global population. The top 1% of emitters, high emitters, are responsible for twice the emissions of the bottom 50%. I think that's a really damning statistic there. And similarly, deep levels of inequality are evident across the UK. So policies need to be specifically tailored to, the, to, to regulate and change the lifestyles of us wealthy high emitters who are responsible for the lion's share of emissions. So it's a very different story depending on where you are, usually to do with income, that relates very closely to our emissions. So to conclude, I think there's a headline choice for developed nations, and it's not a comfortable one. If our preference is to ignore international equity, to pass a huge burden onto our children, to be part of a two and a half to three degree C future and to renege on our Paris commitment. 
But that allows us to nicely dovetail with today's politics. It allows us to maintain the um, economic market model and it allows us to have just incremental adjustments to business as usual. Then fine, carry on with 5% mitigation and net zero by 2050 and just hope our children will forgive us. If instead we think we should take international equity and indeed national equity seriously, then we need a huge mitigation effort by this generation if we're going to cut emissions in line with well below 2 degrees centigrade and thereby abide by our Paris commitments, ideally aim for 1.5. But we have to recognize in doing that because we've chosen to wait for 30 years before doing anything of any significance then we need a huge ramp up in government intervention this wouldn't have been necessary if we started earlier but we were so late we need a profound and rapid, re rapid reshaping of our economics but we've seen that both with the banking crisis and more recently we're still going through this with of course with covid and we need immediate and deep cuts across all sectors there are no exempt sectors to this this is 10 to 20 percent per annum mitigation rate for the wealthy parts of the world and real zero by 2035-ish. Paris requires us to develop new narratives and to do this very rapidly. We need to rethink what constitutes growth, progress and development. To reframe value and rewarding success. We've spent a lot of time in the last few Thursdays over the last few months clapping the key workers who are all, um, well not all, but majority of them are very, very low emitters. We're not paying them. We pay the professors and the policy makers and the entrepreneurs. And so we need to really think about value in our society. How are we going to adjust that? We also need to think about having a different relationship with time to stop just discounting the future, always passing the buck, the burden onto the future and to embed inter and intergenerational equity. So think about the future generations, but also about other people around the world today. And from a broader ecological crisis point of view, as well as a climate point of view, I think we need to have a much deeper appreciation of the more than human world. And I think we're really failing to do that. Climate 2021 is system change. Yeah. Our failure has led us to this position. As Einstein noted, or at least it's attributed to him, insanity is doing the same thing over and over again, expecting a different result. And thus far, we've chosen to pass on to our own children the consequences of 30 years of such insanity. But we have all the tools at our fingertips to make the change that's necessary. So um, on that note, thanks very much for listening. Fantastic. Thank you, Kevin. Very thought provoking and insightful presentation, I think, to start us off on our journey over the next two days. Um, so delegates have been using the, the Q&A the, along the side, which is fantastic to make comments. And we can invite questions here as well for Kevin. Um, we've got about six minutes, well, probably five before the next session. So um, I think we're going to have more questions than we can handle within this time, especially if I keep talking. Um, so what we're going to do is there are discussion forums that have been set up alongside each session. And so the, the speakers will be able to visit those and, and to respond and to continue discussion outside of there. Um, I think just to begin with, um, I'm just browsing through the questions that we have. Please do post your questions in. We've got a very, quite a high level question here, I think, which um, which picks up on the challenges you're, you're, you're essentially setting setting government, Kevin. Um, and the question is, how do you encourage the current government to invest in these ideas that you're proposing? What's, what, what, what are your steps to taking this forward with the government? Well, I think that my immediate thought is there's probably two, three there, um, and maybe even four elements. At first, civil society is doing a very good job on that, on, on this. And I think we really have to thank, uh, strangely, I think we have to thank civil society for bringing climate change issue to the fore, much more than we do the academic community. Um, so I think that they have had a much more integrity in relation to the challenge that we face than indeed the scientific community has in terms of mitigation, not in terms of climate science, in terms of doing something about it. So the civil society groups need to, again, almost redouble their efforts, which have been very significant. But I think the academics need to say in public what they say in private. I think the academic community has really abdicated its responsibility to just be mm. honest in its analysis to the public. We continually, I hope, particularly senior academics, I have many colleagues who say things privately and say, I couldn't let say our job as academics is to say, do our work carefully and then speak honestly to people that want to listen to our messages, not to tailor them for other people. And I think we've done a lot of that for a long time. I also would say the journalists have been really poor on this. Um, I think the journalists have, have not reported on the scale of the mitigation challenge, I'm very distinct from the science. We've done some great work on the science. The scientists need significant credit for that. On mitigation, we have failed at the academic level and I think at the journalistic level. And finally, the other point on that, I think probably using the legal frameworks as we're starting to see more now, we've seen this in Germany and the Netherlands, but we've seen some of the planning applications. So I think the legal framework is another route by which we might better change government's attitude. 
let's engage with the government as much as we can. I see no um, evidence that the current incumbents are particularly interested in these issues. And I think I share similar views there to the to the chair of the Committee on Climate Change and indeed the chief executive in their criti uh, criticism of the current government's approach to mitigation. Thank you, Kevin. Um, just browsing through, there's, um, actually moving on from mitigation, there's a question here um, which congratulates you on, on, on the importance of your talk for mitigation. Um, also asks the question whether we need to plan for adaptation as well alongside. Is that something you have ideas about? Absolutely key. Um, I think we should be um, mitigating, aiming at 1.5 to 2 degrees centigrade, but we should be planning, adapting for probably 3 or 4 degrees centigrade and what that would mean regionally around the world, which will, be very, very, which will vary hugely ac across the geography of the planet. Um, yeah, adaptation is absolutely key, but don't just let's plan for 1.5 to 2, because at the moment we, don't, we do not have the policymakers that are able to drive us in that direction. Thank you. Um, just some, there's another point, a few points we made here about sort of the role of citizens and and the electorate and, and keeping the electorate on board. And you made the point that that's quite an important driving force in terms of connecting with the government. Um, so the question was made: that How do you keep the electorate on board as as this progresses? As, you know, well, this is my that? point towards the end about the equity part. For most mm. people in somewhere like the UK, remember, most people in the UK are by definition below average emitters. And I think for most of those people, the changes that we're going to see are really positive for them much better quality housing we've already got 10 to 20 percent of houses in fuel poverty so much better quality housing by retrofit or by new ones much better public transport better air quality a long-term job security for them and their children because the actual making the shift is like the marshall style reconstruction of europe after the second world war that's the sort of shift in technology um, and, and infrastructure that, that we require so for the majority of people i think this is huge structural change around them that is beneficial at almost every single level the problem is the lion's share of emissions come from the academics from the professors from the policy makers from the barristers from the journalists you know they're from the from the wealthy in society all of us who frame the climate change agenda up or almost with a few exceptions are part of that high emitting group and we have completely re you know not touched the equity issue um and and for us i think it's because we recognize for, for our lives it's profound change in our lifestyles and our norms and our values in fact you know we have to question are we really worth what we're getting paid and our emissions so i think there are two different narratives but the majority of people of course this is a really positive narrative but who controls the message they get to hear the journalists the policymakers, the, all the people in the high energy group so i often say it's, it's you know the chickens have got, the foxes have got to guard the chicken coop and that's going to be difficult to do. What that requires from us, particularly as academics to start with, is integrity. Thank you, Kevin. I think that's a really, that's a fantastic thinking point on, on which to draw this session to a close. We've got um, essentially one minute to move to move across the room. So I really, really very much, very warm thanks, Kevin, for that, for that fantastic presentation and a great start to our event. Many thanks. Thank you.